Welcome to the PIO Podcast, a forum for all things public information related for police, fire, EMS, and local government. A place to grow and develop your public information skills. I am your host, Robert Tornabeni. I have over 11 years of experience as a PIO and 27 years as a law enforcement officer. I am proud to announce that we have partnered with the PIO Toolkit to expand and grow the podcast. Thank you to Christine Townsend and Law Publications for this amazing opportunity. To contact the show, email robert at piotoolkit.com. We need your feedback on how we're doing. Please rate us on whatever platform you listen or send us a review via email. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast to get notified of the latest episodes. Thank you for listening. Sit back and enjoy the next episode. Hello, today on the PIO podcast, we have a a guest, Andrew G. Gilman. He's the president and CEO and founder of Comcore Consulting. He's a public relations and communications firm based out of Washington, D.C., Andrew is an award-winning journalist and lawyer. Mr. Gilman has handled some really high-profile cases and crises, including counsel to the Johnson & Johnson Corporation in the Tylenol crisis, the governor of Canada during the SARS outbreak, global training assignments for General Motors, PepsiCo, and several pharmaceutical companies, and he's also consulted with the FBI uh, during 9-11. He is also the author of the bestseller, Get to the Point, how to say what you mean and get what you want. Andrew, welcome to the show. Thanks, Robert. You know, Andrew, I here. really appreciate you coming on today because you have some really broad background. A lot of your background is in crisis communications, as we can see from the, the things like Tylenol and the SARS outbreak. You spent a, a long time in that. So since most of our listeners are public sector employees in positions dealing with crisis regularly, what do you see as areas for improvement for them to work on? Of course, Robert, there are differences between the public sector and the private sector, but actually there are more similarities. If you're getting ready for a crisis, uh, they will happen. They're not avoidable, but there are the th- things you have to do. You have to plan. So you need to have a crisis plan. And there are many different types of crisis plans. There's an IT plan. There's an operational plan, but there's also a plan for crisis communications. So you need to have that first. Second, whether it's the police department, the fire department, you can't give the fireman the manual and say, read this and you know how to fire the fire. So in order to be ready for a crisis, you have to run drills and simulations so you can test the plan, build your teamwork, find your gaps. And then the other thing you need to think about is after that crisis, instead of just getting back to business as usual, what will we do to help learn some lessons from the crisis? So it's similar. Now, obviously in the public sector, and if it's law enforcement, you're gonna have different wrinkles in that. You've got different reporting. It's not just within a corporation, you've got a city or municipality, but there are many more similarities than differences. Going along with that whole thing that we're right now we're at a real crossroads in law enforcement versus trust or not to trust, fund and not to fund. What what can public information officers do to improve trust in the community of their police officers? Yeah, the, the crossroads we're at is really unfortunate. And it's not easy because there has been a loss of trust in law enforcement, but it's in all aspects of our society. So it's perhaps more intense at times. And every time there's an incident that reinforces it, media will cover it. People in the community will tweet and talk about it and go on social media. On the other hand, what do we do? I think it starts with, you've got to communicate in all different levels. So the public information officer has to reach out to all their constituencies. It's not always fun, but have town halls have open mics, have Q&A with the police chief, fire chief, et cetera, so that the more the community knows and sees and hears from 
their public officials step by step. It's not going to happen overnight. You can hopefully rebuild some of that trust. Also, there is that natural suspicion between the media, if there is actually local coverage of the media. That's been one of the other things that I think contributed to our lack of trust is there's no local news coverage. So people don't get local news. They don't see an interview with the police chief. They don't see an interview with the head of the sanitation commission. So work with the local media. If the media know who you are, they know you as people, when there is an incident, you're not gonna get great coverage. You're gonna get more balanced coverage. So it's about communication and keep the doors open, no matter how tough the you know, is. You know, I like that you brought up the thing about doing town halls and, and things like that. And typically in law enforcement and even in fire service, the, the executives, they change every three to five years or whatever. And that's maybe a good way for the, the community to get to see who that new leader is in the community is have them do those town halls and have them do those Q&As with the chief or the executive to get to know them. It's interesting. Uh, we worked with a major delivery trucking company. And one of the things they get, they do to get good coverage, they invite media to go to their facilities, learn how the driver carries a package, learn how the driver does his or her route safely, and they get pretty good coverage. So one of the things, it's old fashioned, if you're in a town and there is a local reporter or even a blogger or community journalist that you know about, invite them to the station house, invite them to the police uh, fire department, have them ride around. Again, we're all little kids, we love the show and tell. Does that do a heck of a lot? Yes, it does, because you become a real person, you're dealing with real issues about public safety, and it some point will pay off in balanced coverage and the, the community knowing more about you. Thank you. All right, so the speed of social media has really impacted the news cycle. I think we've really seen it with the war in Ukraine right now. We're reminded all the time about what's going on there and and in every crisis that has occurred, we've seen it. You conduct training for executives and corporations. What type of training should public information officers be doing for their executives and their staff? Robert, you mentioned that I, way back when in the 1980s, I worked on the Tylenol crisis, and that's considered sort of the seminal crisis for how a company, Johnson & Johnson, came out of that crisis with actually a better reputation than they went in. Very rare. But there are a couple of big differences, even though this has been a business school case study. One, Johnson & Johnson didn't do anything wrong. They were minding their own business. Somebody came in and poisoned their product. In almost every other crisis we deal with that we have to react to, it's not that you wanted to make the mistake. It's not that you wanted to have the product recall, but you did something. So that's one, what the law, law enforcement or law calls contributory negligence. That was a difference. The second was way back when there was no internet and no social media. So you could control the communications by talking to, at that time, the Chicago Tribune, CBS, NBC, ABC, and a couple of radio stations. Now it's all over the place. So for PIO officers, you have to understand social media. You have to monitor it. That doesn't mean you have to respond right away. You have to figure out multiple channels to communicate it. Everybody's a journalist. So you mentioned Ukraine. Not all of our information comes from a war correspondent that's out there. It's a citizen out there seeing a, an atrocity, seeing a bombing, seeing that awful scene of the family trying to escape going over the bridge. So you have to be aware of those and utilize all the inputs. Let me go to the other side. When you're communicating, you're not just going to hold a press conference or call a couple of reporters. You might have the website of your organization. You might have a Twitter feed, you might have a YouTube channel. And you think about our citizens, everybody gets information in a different way. Some people wanna get a text, some people wanna get an email, some people uh, wanna see the Amber Alert. You know, So again, it, it's there are more channels to use and so the job is more complicated. And on the other hand, it's, it's a richer 
field okay. to work in. Uh, so crises occur all the time, natural disasters, technological, man-made. Planning and preparing for these types of incidents that are crucial. What should PIOs be looking for in training to assess? First of all, Robert, we need to know what kind of crisis we're dealing with. Uh, one of my colleagues in the public relations field, Jim Lukashevsky, started a list uh, a number of years ago of the types of crises. And both the number of crises and the frequency or which is of greatest concern has changed. Right now, the biggest crisis for almost any organization is cyber. It's not just the Russians attacking. There's lots of reasons why people uh, have to fear about uh, crises from a cyber. It could be a state actor. It could be ransomware that just wants money. It could be a kid with a computer that's his or her ego says, I want to go after them. So that's a different kind of crisis than an operational crisis. Your own computer system could go down. The, and the cell phone towers could go down, not necessarily by a cyber attack, but just those things happen. Lord knows we've had enough ethical issues. That's a different kind of crisis than we have. We've got natural disasters, different kind of crisis where in fact, you know, restoration of the services become. So first understand the different type of crises. They have things in common of preparation, plan for this kind of crisis, implement that plan, and then what do I need to do to restore afterwards? But starts with know the different kind of crises for sure. Excellent, thank you, Andrew, I really appreciate it. What questions do you think our listeners would have want, would want answered? in the PIO aspect right now, if, if they had a chance to ask you a question, what would, what would you think that they would ask? I think you hit it with one of your other questions because the thing that's lurking over all this for a PIO is trust in our institutions. You wanna know, and I'll, I'll bring it up now because one of your questions you wanna ask about is what book do you recommend? Well, in this field, my favorite book is a book called The Checklist Manifesto, written by Dr. Atul Gawande, who's still a practicing surgeon in Boston. And this book, The Checklist Manifesto, does a study of operating rooms all across the world. And the premise of the book, which he proves out with real data is that in the operating room, if the physicians, nurses, all the people working there use more checklists before the operation, during the operation and closing up at the end of the operation, they are fewer infections, fewer readmissions, fewer complications and fewer fatalities. So that's a question of, okay, operations. But the other point you come back to, how do we build trust? And I think it doesn't happen overnight. It's step by step. It's understanding that we're all in this together. As somebody said recently on an interview I saw, it's not a red country, it's not a blue country, it's a red, white, and blue country. We're gonna have to do it step by step and figure out ways in every community to do it. Andrew, to do I that. really like that I, the checklist manifesto thing because I all right, I just Google it, found one of what I've I've added in the show notes. But an interesting thing, if you think about the airline industry or NASA, everything is a checklist with them. And the airline industry, even though crashes still occur, in the grand scheme of things, the, the thousands of flights that happen every day, it's still the safest transportation industry in the, in the world because they have yeah. that, the checklist, the, the, the pre-flight check, the pilot check, the co-pilot check, the engineer check, every one of those things they have to do. So I guess in our aspect for a public information officer, they need to have a checklist too of what they're doing and how they're doing it. Ab Absolutely. And here's an example, Robert, because you brought it up. I still remember years ago, Alaska Airlines had a flight that I think was going from someplace in California down to Mexico. Unfortunately, the plane crashed. Within minutes of knowing of that, they had a statement on their website saying, not everything they knew, but what they knew at the time. Plane has crashed. We're looking at for more information. We'll have updates as pass as we have them. Maybe 15 minutes later, you don't have to be exact every 15 minutes. They had an update on their website. There was a statement once they knew there were fatalities from the airline president that was on the website. So that was the checklist that 
the communications team at, the, at Alaska Airlines had. Similarly, you can have a set of templates for a PIO for all the different kinds of crises that we mentioned. You pre-write them. Then when the event occurs, you have less information to fill in the blanks so you can get it up uh, quickly. The, so that's the kind of checklist that needs to happen. So airlines have it, they know things are gonna occur. NASA knows things are gonna occur. We all know in the PIO world, things will occur at any of our agencies and departments. We should be ready for that. Excellent. Thank you, Andrew. All right, so let's lighten this up a little bit. We'll hit those rapid fire questions. Um, favorite musician, actor style? Well, I'm gonna give away my age, but I did go to Woodstock and there were lots of acts that I do remember, but probably my favorite was Crosby, Sills, Nash & Young. Okay. Chocolate or vanilla? Chocolate, if given those choices. Uh, I asked about, you already mentioned it, a must-read book is the uh, Checklist Manifesto. Yeah. If you could have coffee with anyone living or deceased, who would it be and why? John F. Kennedy. Oh, why? That would be, that would be because yeah. I wasn't old enough to vote for him, uh, but it was a different era. And it was coming out of the post-war era. It was the symbol of America growing up, having helped save the world in World War II potentials. Uh, listen, he was a very fallible human being, but we never got the full measure of him. So that would probably be the one person and ask him also to look back, gee, what do you think of the world now? I like that. Uh, that's an interesting one. Favorite drink of choice? I'm not going to let you pin me down to one. It would be a really <laughs> good, strong red wine and or uh, a single malt scotch. Okay. I'm a, I'm a bourbon person, but scotch I can do too. I, uh, they're pretty close. Um, yes. They're made somewhat similarly. At, uh, as the French say, chacun a son goût. Each to his own taste. <laughs> there you go. What would be your superpower if you could get one? Oh, what's that famous line? Um, Sandra Bullock said in that movie, world peace. Uh, you know, it, isn't you know, it, it, that's it, so true. I'll give you a, a bit because I remember one time when my father came to visit us in Washington, D.C., and he was a World War II veteran, and we went down to the World War II Memorial, and he started crying. And I said, Dad, why are you crying? Because you missed some of your buddies from the war and some that passed away. He says, nah. I'm crying because we haven't learned anything yet. I mean, it, it, it's the human condition. And yes, it's it's our cities, it's our towns, it's our counties, it's our states, it's globally. And uh, we haven't learned that much. So my superpower would be figure out a way to allow the, the average human being who gets caught up, who's trying to protect the peace, to have an easier life. I like that. I like that. Uh, final thoughts. What's your biggest takeaway you hope the listeners learn from this today? It's probably a couple of words that begin with the letter P. If you're going to do better in preparing for crisis, you have to prepare. You have to plan. You have to practice. And then to get back the trust we've been talking about throughout this discussion, it's the passion for your job, the passion for your community. Why do people go into become a PIO because they're involved in some aspect of community and social service and communicate why you do that, why you like your communities. That's the passion part. So it's all those letters P's that I want people to take away, but prepare, practice, plan, bring it, bring some passion. Amazing way to close it out. Uh, Andrew, how can people best reach out to you if they wanna learn more, connect with you professionally? We have a website www.comcore consulting that's c o m m as in mary mary c o c o r e consulting all one word.com um i'm i have a twitter feed at a gilman uh easy to find us um and uh happy to chat with people it's uh one of my passions to help each of our communities around the country do a better job uh, serve their constituents better and uh, build back that trust. And I will add all that into the show notes so that uh, people can find a quick link. 
Andrew, I really appreciate you coming on the show. I Thank you very much, and I hope you have a great day. My pleasure, Robert, and I think this show does a great service for the PIOs out there. Thank you very much, sir. Have a great day. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast to get notified of the latest episode. If you are listening on a platform that allows reviews, please give us a review. We appreciate any review, good or bad. It helps us improve on each episode. Until next time, be safe.